Biodiversity is simply the variety of life on Earth in all of its different forms and combinations. It includes three main types of diversity. First, there's ecosystem diversity, which means the range of different habitats and natural communities, like a forest, a coral reef, or even a prairie. Each of these ecosystems has its own unique mix of living things. Second, we have species diversity, which refers to the number of different kinds of plants, animals, and other organisms in a particular area. This is what most people think of when they hear biodiversity. Finally, there's genetic diversity, which is the variety of genes within a single species. This is important because it helps species adapt to changes like the introduction of a new disease or a changing environment. So diversity isn't just about counting different animals, it's about the whole complex web of life from the smallest gene to the largest ecosystem. Some ecologists and evolutionary biologists try to compare the number of species on Earth today with how many there have been in the past. While scientists have already discovered, named, and described almost 2 million species, this is likely just a fraction of all of the life out there. Experts believe there could be millions or even tens of millions more species, especially in places we haven't fully explored like the deep sea or tropical rainforests. What's even more interesting is that the evidence from fossils tells us a surprising story. There are actually more species alive today on Earth right now than at almost any other point in history. Life has generally become more diverse over long stretches of time, with new species evolving and filling new roles. For example, after major events like the extinction of the dinosaurs, new groups of mammals evolved and diversified. However, the issue that we face today isn't that current numbers are low compared to the past, but rather the extremely fast rate at which species are disappearing due to human activities. This rapid loss is unlike the natural extinction events of the past and is creating a significant challenge for the planet's biodiversity. The causes of species extinction today are overwhelmingly human-driven, marking what many scientists call the sixth mass extinction, which is distinct from the natural, non-human causes of past extinction events like asteroid impacts or massive volcanic eruptions. This current crisis stems from our rapidly expanding global footprint and unsustainable practices. For instance, the extinction of the North Island giant moas, a colossal flightless bird from New Zealand, represent the loss of terrestrial megafauna primarily due to overhunting by early human settlers and subsequent habitat alteration. Similarly, the Caribbean monk seal provides an example of a marine species lost due to overexploitation for their oil and meat by European colonists, alongside habitat disturbance. In North America, we've seen the extinction of the passenger pigeon, which at one point was the most abundant bird, primarily due to overhunting and habitat destruction, as forests were cleared for agriculture and human settlement, demonstrating how an incredibly numerous species can be driven to extinction by human pressures. These case studies collectively highlight that the primary driver of today's extinctions, which include direct overexploitation like hunting and fishing, habitat destruction and fragmentation for agriculture, urbanization, and logging, pollution, and the spread of invasive species and climate change, all stem from human activities. As we already stated, many ecosystems are being lost due to human activities, either directly or indirectly. An example you need to know for the IB exam of direct activity is the destruction of mixed dipterocarp forests in Southeast Asia. These biodiverse rainforests are being cleared at a high rate, primarily to make way for vast palm oil plantations and other agricultural expansion, as well as for logging. This is a direct human cause driven by global demand for products like cooking oil and timber. Examples of indirect human impacts also contribute to ecosystem loss, such as climate change altering habitats or pollution making ecosystems unhabitable. The ongoing loss of these ecosystems has consequences such as species extinction, reduced natural resources, and less stable environments. We know there's a biodiversity crisis because of strong evidence collected from many people around the world. Major reports, like those from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, abbreviated IPBES, collect tons of information that clearly shows species are disappearing and ecosystem destruction is prevalent. 
This proof comes from reliable surveys done all over the world in all kinds of places like oceans, forests, and even the local areas where you live. You can see some of the conclusions drawn from the 2019 IPBES report here. These surveys are key because they need to be repeated over time in the same spots. By comparing the results from years apart, scientists can see real changes. For example, they might notice a decrease in species richness, meaning fewer different kinds of insects are found, for example or a shift in species evenness, where one type of plant becomes common while others become rare. This means the total number of species hasn't changed, but the distribution of those species has. We can see an example of changes in richness and evenness by looking at this model, where each different color represents a different species within an ecosystem. From the starting ecosystem, we can see changes in species numbers going this way, which would be a change in richness. And a change not in total species numbers but in distribution would be this way, which impacts evenness. Getting back to the survey reports, the constant checking gives us clear proof that the number and balance of species are changing. Both expert scientists and everyday people acting as citizen scientists Scientists help collect this data, showing us the true scale of the problem. The primary driver behind the current biodiversity crisis is ever-increasing human population growth, which puts immense pressure on Earth's natural resources and systems. This overarching cause leads to several specific threats to ecosystems. One major factor is hunting and other forms of over-exploitation, where species are harvested at unsustainable rates for food, medicine, and other products, pushing their populations to collapse. Another significant cause is urbanization, the expansion of cities and towns, which directly destroys and fragments natural habitats, replacing diverse ecosystems with concrete and infrastructure. Similarly, deforestation and the clearance of land for agriculture are massive contributors to habitat loss, as vast areas of forests, grasslands, and wetlands are converted into farms or pastures, stripping away natural homes of many species. Furthermore, pollution of air, water, and soil damages ecosystems and harms individual organisms organisms, making environments unlivable. Finally, the rapid increase in global transport facilitates the unintentional spread of pests, disease, and invasive alien species to new areas, where they can outcompete native species, disrupt food webs, and cause further extinctions, compounding the threats to biodiversity. All of these things are in part or fully caused by humans, and with an increased global population size, each individual problem can get worse. Solving the biodiversity crisis requires a multi-pronged approach because no single strategy is enough and different species and ecosystems need different kinds of help. One crucial method is in situ conservation, which means protecting species right in their natural homes. This includes the vital work of managing nature reserves, which can be found all over the world, where habitats are carefully protected and restored to allow species to thrive. Another powerful in situ approach is rewilding and reclamation of degraded ecosystems, which involves restoring damaged areas back to their natural state, allowing wildlife to return and ecological processes to heal. However, for species facing immediate extinction threats or those whose habitats are too damaged, ex situ conservation becomes a better option. This involves protecting species outside their natural environments, such as in zoos and botanical gardens, which serve as safe havens and breeding grounds for endangered animals and plants. Furthermore, the storage of germ plasm in seed or tissue banks acts as a crucial genetic backup, preserving the genetic materials of countless plant species around the world for future generations, ensuring that even if a species vanishes from the wild, its genetic blueprint still survives and can potentially be utilized in the future. When prioritizing conservation efforts, a unique approach is the Edge of Existence program, which focuses on evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered species. The main idea behind this program is that limited conservation money and effort should go towards species that represent a huge amount of unique evolutionary history and are also highly endangered. We can think of the tree of life, where some species are like tiny twigs with many close relatives, and others are like ancient solitary branches with no close living relatives. If one of those solitary branches goes extinct, it means the loss of millions of years of unique evolution, which is a part of life's history that can never be replaced. An example of a species on the edge list is the giant ibis. This huge, striking bird is unique because it's the largest of its family and the only member of its genus. Its numbers are very low and are continuing to drop. 
It is seen mostly in Cambodia, with small populations in Laos and Vietnam, and it's already gone from Thailand. The giant ibis is critically endangered largely due to human disturbance and hunting, and its decline might also be linked to fewer large grazing animals like water buffalo, who swallows the ibis uses for feeding. By protecting species like the giant ibis, the EDGE program is attempting to preserve the unique biological features that have developed within this species line. This approach helps make the biggest possible impact with conservation work.